Hello, tubers. Welcome to another show on Snafu Radio. If you like the content on this channel, give it a thumbs up. Be sure and subscribe. I also have a website called snafuradio.com. Be sure to subscribe to that and so you can get updates on that stuff, too. And by all means, you can mirror the videos if you wish. Just give a little credit to Snafu Radio so other people can know to come here and get this information firsthand because we are ahead of the curve on everything, just like I tell you. Now, today, we have a real special guest. Mark Sargent, and I interviewed him on 7-16-2015 when he was just starting out his interviews. So since then, he's become quite polished. He's had a lot of credible guests, a lot of ex-military guys, and even some that are still active, and a lot of people that have information that you would normally not ever hear. So let me go ahead and bring in Mark. Mark, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, Scott. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. Trust me, I'm super pumped about this. So since everybody already pretty well knows you, we don't have to go into all your backstory and everything. We can go ahead and just jump right into the meat where we're going to talk a lot about just facts, no theory, so it can give other people a really good insight on how to discuss these topics with other people with credible information. Sure. So with that, let's kind of go ahead and talk about the math and how the, the formula actually figures out so people can kind of get that uh, uh, figured out first. Sure. The, the math that, again, with the Flat Earth community, the math that we have to look into, we just have to know before we throw it out, basically. So, you know, like when they say the sun is 93 million miles away, you, it's like we, you have to know that number before you can tear it down. Uh, you, you have to basically know your opponent because that's what they're going to throw at you. And when it comes to the curvature of the Earth, again, we didn't make up any of these cool little factoids. The curvature of the Earth is really simple, and I'll, I'll try not to overwhelm anybody with it. It is 8 inches per mile squared. Now, I've told people on the street that, and when they hear that squared part, all of a sudden their, their mind jumps back to early algebra in high school, and they freak out. It's like, oh, I did terrible in that class. I just wanted to get out. You know, they weren't going to go into geometry or trigonometry. But the the simple comparison would be this. We've all heard of, you know, when something, when you throw a rock off a cliff, it, it speeds up to 32 feet per second per second. That's all we're talking about here is 8 inches per mile per mile, which is, simple version, is say you have 2 miles. Something's 2 miles away. That's 2 times 2 which is 4, times 8 is 32 inches. And then it gets worse as you get along. So 3 times 3 is 9, times 8 is 72 inches, and it goes further and further along until you get up to where, and you guys can break out your calculators whenever you want. Uh, we get like 50 miles. You think, well, that's not a lot. you know. But yeah, it is, because when you get up to like 50 miles, then it's 50 times 50 times 8, which is about 1,670 feet, roughly. And that's huge. That's a, that's a huge amount of curvature. And you're saying, okay, why does that matter? It's like, well, because at 50 miles, something should be 1,670 feet on the other side of the hill. You shouldn't be able to see any objects less than that height on the other side of the hill. And we can see them at that distance and much, much greater. So very, very interesting. No, I agree. And that's going to be our jump off point. Because since you started these interviews back um, in 2015, you have had a lot of guests on. And one of the ones I thought was really interesting was a naval guy that could paint targets with a laser 50 miles away. Would you, why don't you go ahead and bring us up to speed on that? Oh, yeah. He was one of the first guys remember everybody that came to me every one of my subject matter experts that came to me was unsolicited i did not know these guys from adam they just called me or emailed me or both 
And in this case, it, and he it wasn't even anonymous. He wanted his name out there. And I, I knew why. It was because he was eventually going to get out of the Navy. And he was very clever. And that was if he got out, if, if they tried to nail him for a Section 8, well, that's a book right there, you know, na being nailed for a Section 8 on flat earth theory. Oh, that thing just writes itself. But his name was Sean McCrary. And he came to me and he was a sparrow missile system instructor he wasn't just a, a an operator he was an actual instructor he taught people how to use the sparrow missile system on navy boats for the united states military and he came out and said that look he is you may be onto something because we are painting ship targets that are 50 nautical miles away you know and a nautical mile is a little bit longer than a land mile otherwise known as a statute mile and we're going ship to ship. We're going point to point. We're not bouncing off of the atmosphere. We're going a straight line of sight. And those ships are not very tall, you know, maybe 100 feet, 200 feet tops. You know, they're not, they're not that big, depending on what you're looking at. So how are we hitting these targets? You know, we're, we're using, a, a, I think it was a two degree beam radar. And they, you know, they had a certain technology to where they could keep the beam from spreading. You know, like lasers, they will spread out fairly quickly. I think it's like uh, six inches per mile, something like that, or a foot, two feet per mile. Crap, I can't remember. But anyway, a you, normal laser spreads out. Military technology though, is much, much better. And, he's, and what they do is they paint the target. You've seen this in different movies where you're painting the target with a beam, then you fire the missile, and the missile, while it's up in the air, will look for that beam. It will look for wherever the target's being painted. And as long as that beam's there, that, that missile will go down and hit it. And let, if you're not painting the target, the, the missile has nothing, doesn't know what to do. In fact, if you pull the beam off of the target, the missile will just detonate. It'll go ballistic and then blow itself up because it doesn't want to turn into a friendly fire thing. And he goes, look, we're with long distance binoculars, we can see these targets a long, long way away. And he, he also pointed out that at night, we can see them with infrared. And that for me was one of the most damning things you could, you could ask for because infrared doesn't lie. Look, it's a heat signature. And if it's an optical illusion, well, mirages can't generate heat because technically they're not there. They don't exist. So he was confirming everything. He's going, look, we, we can see them. They're on infrared. We can target them with a beam radar. And not only that, he, just for good measure, he mentioned that we also don't take in the Coriolis effect when we're firing, which is also known as the, the spin of the Earth. So if you, everyone knows that the Earth is supposedly spinning at 1,000 miles an hour at the equator and much, much less until you get to the North Pole where it's spinning at zero miles an hour. And he said that we do not factor in this formula into our equations ever. We just fire the missile and it goes there. He goes, it's interesting because we've all heard of the Coriolis effect. We just don't use it. So there you go. That was the first guy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that, that guy was really good. When I heard that interview, I was like, oh, damn, yeah. this is good stuff. Yeah. Then you had another guy that came on that was – a valve expert, and right. he was talking primarily about the space station and how that is impossible. It cannot be a space station up there because of what his experience told him. Why don't you enlighten everybody about that guy? There was a guy further down the line. He was an industrial engineer specializing in valves and seals. And he wasn't the only engineer to contact me, but he was very specialized. He said, look, he goes, when it comes to military grade valves and seals, like for doors, you know, like we, he goes, the, the, the easiest comparison would be submarines. Every Navy ship, including submarines, has a full blown machine shop on board because the seals have to be, especially in submarines, we're talking about airtight containers. We all know this when we, we watch movies and television, even documentaries. When you go from one compartment to the next, you shut the door behind you because in case something ever go, especially in times of war, uh, because you, if something goes wrong, you want only that compartment to be flooded. You don't want uh, anything else to go wrong. And he mentioned that there's only a few companies in the world that supply these, these military. He goes, there's only like five companies that he even knows of that supplies these very, very specialized valves and seals. And he works for one of them. And he actually wanted to remain anonymous because he still works for them. And he goes, okay, so on the Navy ships, these machine shops are there and they have to, the, the tolerances are very, very stringent. You know, you have to create very, very 
tight seals. And he goes, what exactly are they using up on the, uh, the ISS? The otherwise known as the International Space Station, otherwise known as the International Fake Station. Because <laughs> there's nothing... There's nothing there. He goes, one, first off, he goes, the doors between the, the compartments, they never shut them, ever, if you can even find the doors, which is impossible. He goes, look, he goes, if there's a micrometeor that comes by this thing, the size of a nickel, punches a hole in that thing in the side wall of the ISS, you remember, because it's just aluminum, he goes, they're all dead. He goes, for several reasons. One, because they don't have any doors. You know, it's like the whole compart, the whole thing, which is you know, the atmosphere would be sucked out instantaneously, and everyone would die. The second thing is, is that all the astronauts never seem to be in spacesuits ever. They're always wearing the most casual stuff you could ever wear. They're wearing khakis, polo shirts, and socks. That's all they wear, you know, and tight belts for whatever reason. They always, you know, very loose clothing except for their belts, which are always very, very tight. I. You know, you want to say that's for the harness? Yeah, maybe. Don't know. But he goes, on top of that, he goes, okay, so he goes, where are they getting the parts? He goes, the things wear out. He goes, especially like in aircraft. Anyone knows anything about aircraft maintenance? Aircraft don't, they're not like cars. You, like when you and I, we drive our cars, we drive it until something breaks. You know, the water pump finally fails. Like, all right, we got to get a new water pump or a new distributor cap or a new set of brakes or whatever it is. You wait till they break before you fix it. With aircraft, because we're talking about people's lives, and you know, it's you're in the sky. If something breaks up there, you're in real trouble because you're not going to have a mechanic fix something at 500, 600 miles an hour. So what they do is they literally base it on time. They don't base it on how even if the part looks perfectly fine, they don't care. It's all based on how many hours has that part been used, and then they say, okay, it's even if it's got like a 95% success rate, they, they swap it out. Based on if it says, well, okay, this the lifespan of this part is six months. When they're on the ground, they swap it out. It doesn't make any difference. So he, he, one of his other things was like, when are they swapping out parts up there? You should have a constant stream of parts going up to that station at all times because it never, ever happens. Not only that, uh, but the, the, find me a, a, a video where the, these astronauts are up there. There should be dedicated, basically, mechanics on board doing nothing but working, not talking to school children via Skype, not doing little experiments with water. They should be working. They should be turning wrenches and drills and doing stuff all the time, and you never, ever see that. Uh, what you may not have listened to, I mean, that guy was good, the international, I'm sorry, the industrial engineer specializing in valves and seals, but the guy I just had a couple weeks ago, he was an industrial vacuum expert. Oh. That guy was fascinating. Because he called up kind of based on the other guy, and he all he does is, is he creates, he works for an electronics company, he wouldn't say what, and I even if he did, I wouldn't tell you. But they create, they have to create complete vacuum chambers for creating certain types you know like a clean room type environment for creating electronics and he's going you have no idea the power of the vacuum that has to be used to suck all the because you got to get not not just dust not just micro particles of dust you basically have to f take out every molecule that isn't accounted for in that little chamber and he says that you have to do it in stages. So like you use a, a certain vacuum motor to get out 90, 95%. And then a much, much bigger vacuum motor to get like 95 to 98%. And then another one to get even further down, 90. He goes, he goes, you get to a certain point when you're getting out that last 1% of the molecules out of that chamber, he goes, there isn't enough horsepower on this world to take it out. He goes, it's, it's that tough to get. He goes, the only way you can get that last 1% is you have to use a chemical leaching process to where you put something in there and it actually sucks out. You know, it leaches out just those, that last finally, tiny, tiny fragment. And it was fascinating because he was talking about vacuums in, uh, if anyone knows anything about vacuums, it's measured in units of tor. Brand new thing for your listeners, I'm sure. Uh, T-O-R-R, -R, named after uh, an Italian guy, I believe, named Tornacelli. Tornacelli? Anyway, so if that, the vacuum, or the, and you get down to negative numbers to where when you're getting close to simulating the vacuum power of space, he goes, you're getting down to where you're like negative 8, negative 9, negative 10 tor. He goes, that is an unbelievably powerful vacuum. 
He goes, that that will rip things apart. I mean, because you, you, you're talking about a space with molecules versus a space, a vacuum, with, which is basically a space with no vol, equalizing the, the pressures between the two. And what he was basically saying was, he's going, look, the ISS is in a negative nine or higher Tor environment. He's going, and we're talking about aluminum here. You know, it, you know, like in a submarine, it's the opposite. You have water pressure that's pushing in. But in the ISS, you've got an inner pressure that's trying to get out into space. He's going, how is aluminum and plastic holding that atmosphere in, that artificial atmosphere in? He goes, it is, there's no way. That, he goes, that thing would just blow up. He goes, spacesuits, astronauts walking around in spacesuits? No, not a chance. He goes, they, they would blow up like the Michelin Man. And the, because the air pressure would be constantly trying to get out, you know, and in, in the, because the vacuum of space is extremely powerful. And let me add one more thing, because I know I'm going off a little rant here, but it's something I'm kind of working up because I'm, I'm dealing with a scientist, I think, uh, on Monday, where it's like, okay, if the power of the vacuum, you know, you, you, you know this yourself, everybody's played with vacuums as a kid, you know, those simple, very small vacuums that we use to clean our homes with, right? You, you, you have those, the, the ones with the nozzles on. Look, you can pick up some pretty heavy objects with those nozzles. You can def beat gravity all day long. And I know it's creating a seal, but look, people can pick up bowling balls in two seconds with a, with a simple household vacuum, right? And those are dense objects. So tell me how exactly the absolute vacuum of space, a negative 10 Tor environment, is not ripping off the loose gases that is our atmosphere because remember our atmosphere goes up and up and up and eventually it reaches space right so there's got to be an edge between our atmosphere and space what's keeping that atmosphere down here and the argument from science and i know this is what the scientist is going to tell me is going well it's gravity it's going oh gravity's good but it's not that good and remember gravity's a constant whereas vacuums are not. Plus you have gases up there that are already defying gravity, like helium gas, hydrogen gas, uh, fluorocarbons. Those things are already rising. Oh, you, you fill up some, a balloon with helium, it's just gonna keep going up, right? It's already trying to get out. So it's not like you have this weird tension between the absolute vacuum of space and our atmosphere. So where's the bleeding edge? Where Where's this defining moment between are you know the oxygen and nitrogen and the trace gases that we have and nothingness the power of that vacuum should rip our thing completely off and what i'm saying a lot of other people are saying too is it only works in an enclosed system meaning we're in a, a dome a pressurized system because the gas can't get out that's the only way it works but science has to come back and say well no gravity's keeping it on there because their the argument is well if it wasn't then we'd all be dead that's that's literally their argument. It's like, well, gravity, it's got to be gravity. How does it got to be gravity? Well, because if it isn't, the, the gases would all rip off and we all be die. So you're, you're working backwards with your argument. You're saying, well, we're just going to say it's gravity because it's not gravity. We don't have any other excuse for it. It's fascinating. So sorry that I'm a little off into the weeds there, but you see where I was going. Yeah, no, that is awesome. That's why I brought you on so you could get into the weeds and start really kind of debunking what some of these people want to, you know, come out with their closed mind, not no pun intended for right. the closed atmosphere, right. or, you know, but yeah, no, that was awesome. So um, there was another guest that was on and was also on Jaronism, I believe, of that lady pilot that was overseas that got grounded just for mentioning right. Flat Earth. What do you know about that she one? She had contacted me because Jaron missed his appointment. And if you're listening, Jaron, you know what I mean. Good Lord, man. Get a schedule. Uh, he, but she, she had contacted <laughs> me and said, hey, I can't find Jaron. <laughs> like, I was supposed to talk to him a while ago, you know, like an hour ago. And so I sent a thing to him, and I didn't know how, how much time she had or, you know, as you know, in any sort of journalistic sense you, you got to grab your opportunities where you can it's like oh, holy crap you know she she might crash tomorrow so i decided to, to pick her up and she is a co-pilot in has been flying 737s for most of her life and she was with a her her the 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 main captain and then an instructor who was in the jump seat i think behind and they were talking about stuff and they were you know as you know you when you're on autopilot you know, there's not a lot to do 
And she starts getting into the flat earth thing. And they were giving her a whole bunch of grief. And it got to the point where she said, you know what? I don't even want to talk to you guys anymore. You, you know, the instructor, he can sit in my seat and you guys can land the plane. You know, I'm just going to, you know, be quiet. And they were a little worried. It's like, you know, because they thought that she might go after her for harassment, not sexual, but just general harassment. And she gets down below, you know, she gets, they get down on the ground. And later she goes into the doctor's. And she mentions to them that she believes in flat earth. And the corp company doctor, that the airline doctor says, look, we, we can't let you back up there. You know, we can't, we can't put you back in a pilot seat. Not if you're going to, you're going to stick to this. And she stuck to it. So, and, and they said, okay, we're, we're going to bench you. We're going to, we're going to sit you down on the pine and you, you know, you're, you're going to stay, basically stay here until you turn this around. And she wouldn't do it. And it was amazing. It was really cool. And, but she was, you know, she's the one, she's not the only pilot I've talked to. I've talked to like five or six different pilots, including a, a flight instructor out of uh, ooh, Iowa, I think. And she w said the same thing that everybody else says. Like, look, every, it looks from a pilot standpoint, because they have a wonderful vantage from the, the, the front of that airplane. She goes, it looks perfectly flat. But because of our conditioning when we're children, it can't be flat, right? Can't be. It's like, look, right. we're growing up that you see the globe in the classroom and, and that's with you your entire life. The globe is there. The globe is your home. The globe is your friend. And so they look at it and they, so it's kind of a paradox for pilots. Most pilots don't believe it's flat, but they know. They, they, they know of the phenomena because they, you know, because they see it. It's like it looks flat. Absolutely, you know, from 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 left to right, forward and backwards, and and all their instruments. Remember the the gyroscope. the The big thing is when you spin up the gyroscope, which is an electrical device uh, on the ground. You spin it up on the the tarmac because you're you're trying to find your level, and it stays perfectly level to orientate you. I'm sorry, orientate, orientate, whatever. It you're supposed to. Yeah. The the gyroscope will let you know where you stand in relation to when you spun it up onto the ground because it assumes that the ground is always level. Well, the problem there is is that the gyro should be moving every once in a while because a plane traveling at 500 miles an hour is going to be going over the hill very, very quickly. You know, it's going to be going down thousands of feet every hour. Technically, it's going to be either nosing down or nosing up. And nobody ever feels this in a plane. We look at the raw data from the planes. It's like they go almost straight up. They fly perfectly level and then they go straight down. Uh, in fact, some raw data I put out recently was was from the, the air traffic uh, database where they, they showed it, you know, p planes going up over the United States, flying perfectly level and then going down. What was interesting was when they overlaid it on their computer map, they showed the United States as perfectly flat. But that shouldn't be. The raw data should be a curved surface. So why would they straighten it out? That's because that is the raw data. You're living on a flat plane. And it was interesting. So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping she's getting in a little bit of a trouble right now from what I understand. I hopefully... Uh, she comes out of it okay. I would like them not to fire her, but if they do fire her, I mean, it's a great story, and she might be able to turn it into something. I, I just not exactly sure what her ultimate motivation would be. The gyroscope was exactly where I was going to lead towards, and you jumped right on into that and addressed mm -hmm. that, so that was yeah, perfect. The, the gyroscope <laughs> is a fascinating thing. Uh, I even had a, uh, real quick, I had a commercial airline captain for a 777, you know, that's flagship stuff, and he, what people know is there's a gyroscope and then there's devices underneath it, like, I think, I don't know if they call them a gyroscope compensator, but he had one that went, that, that failed while he was down on the ground. And so he was at a certain airport, and usually they have parts, and they come in, they swap out these little things. And they said, look, we don't have a replacement for that right now. You're just going to have to fly and make adjustments for the uh, the curvature of the earth and the Coriolis effect uh, manually. And he decided, because he'd been following this for a while, he decided he was going to make the calculations, but then not adjust the plane and see what happens. And that's exactly what he did. He, he didn't make the adjustments and he got to his destination without changing a thing. 
So you know, all of a sudden he's like, okay, if I didn't have to change anything, what exactly is that stupid box down doing below the, the gyroscope? What's this compensator actually doing? So he proceeded to try to contact the company, figure out, it's like, okay, you want to ask questions. And he said that he was very specific about this. He said that pilots usually have free reign when it comes to talking to airline companies. It's like, look, they're, they're all one big happy family and airline manufacturers love pilots. You know, why wouldn't they? That's their guys, their ringers. It's like a shoe company and a basketball player. And they would not talk to him to save his life. They, he eventually found out what, what company it was, and it was basically one company that was making all of these things. And they were a subcontractor for NASA. And he, and he said, <laughs> of course, of course they would be. And they, they just put these things on there. They, I, you know, it's, they don't do anything, though. They, there's, no, there's no compensation made. The, equ the, the math is there. They, they make the equations, but the plane actually doesn't change course. Uh, and he thought that was fascinating. He now, of course, wanted to remain anonymous, but it, uh, it was still a, a, a very intriguing uh, take on the whole flatter thing. That's perfect, because now this goes right in, and I remember that interview. I watched that one. And this goes right into basically where you first started doing your interviews about how flights, couldn't fly from Australia to South right. America. And I thought that was really fascinating. What I'm sure you may have a little bit better description on how to describe that to people now. So let's talk about sure. that for a minute. And the, and the flatness of it, because people seem to have a hard time with this. Well, it's a circle. Were, were they flying around in the circle? Blah, yeah, blah, blah, they, blah, blah. So go yeah, ahead. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly what they're doing. I mean, just because you move your finger in a circle around a dinner plate, technically you've circumnavigated the dinner plate. Does that make a dinner, the dinner plate a sphere, a globe, a ball? No. It just means you went in a circle. Yeah, it, technically it's round. And I know it shouldn't bug me when people say, oh, the world's round. Uh, but it bugs me because round doesn't necessarily mean that it's three-dimensional. Round can also be used for just two-dimensional things. Again, a dinner plate is round. Your dining room table is round. A hubcap is round. But that doesn't mean that any of these things are three-dimensional, which is why I always say either sphere or bar or, I'm sorry, ball or globe. And when it came to the flights in the Southern Hemisphere, because we're talking about a dinner plate world or an enclosed world, there are no shortcuts, meaning there eventually you're going to run into land masses that literally you can't cheat with because they're on opposite ends of the, the, you know, the, the plate, the plane. In this case, it's Australia and South America. Australia is on one side, South America is on the other side, and there's a whole lot of ocean on the outside. And... If you were trying to follow the rules, well, you'd go, uh, you know, take the outer rim and, and go across the ocean most of the time, way, way out into the ocean. Unfortunately, those distances would be too great. So you're going to have to cheat a little bit and cut across places where you normally wouldn't go. It wouldn't make any sense on a globe Earth. For example, if you're going from, let's say, Buenos Aires to Sydney, Australia, right? Why and you should just be cutting across one of the major oceans down in the southern hemisphere, but you're not. You're almost always taking a connection north, way, 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 way north, to uh, you know, like say Los Angeles or Dallas or San Francisco. Why are you going through the United States to get to Australia if you're going from Buenos Aires? You shouldn't be able to. You're doubling or tripling your distance in some cases. And it's because you have to, because you have to get across. Remember, there's no shortcuts on a uh, on a flat Earth. The, the globe is 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 completely an illusion in this case. So, what I ran into, I mean, there's different people that I've talked to about this. One, of course, was when it, when I initially made the clues, I I thought it was awfully strange, and why it didn't bug more people, I have no I have no idea. That 95 percent of the flights in the southern hemisphere are connections. Meaning if you're going from Africa to South America or South America to Australia or anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere, the, you're, you're going to be using huge connections, connections that don't make any sense. Uh, you know, connections that you should, you know, it should be like a 12 hour flight across an ocean 
and you're ending up going 40 hours through double connections through all over the place. You're going through Dubai, you're going through the United States, you're going through Europe. It doesn't doesn't make any sense unless it's on a flat world, in which case these routes become almost point to point or a shallow dog leg. And I remember uh, I read a statement. There was a uh, commercial. Uh, uh, bu- 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 hang on, I'm looking her up real quick. A corporate travel agent. Yeah, commercial travel agent. She worked exclusively in the Southern Hemisphere. And she said people complain all the time down there because you can't get direct flights anywhere down there. I mean, yeah, there's a few direct flights, but it's just this tiny, tiny handful. But I mean, there's a lot of capital cities down there, which you cannot get direct flights for, for any amount of money. First class, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And <clears throat> up in the Northern Hemisphere, where, where most of the traffic is, we're very, very spoiled. You can get a nonstop just about anywhere you want to go from place to place. It just comes down to what time do you want to leave and how much money you want to spend. Down in the Southern Hemisphere, even though it should be just as easy. Remember, the Southern Hemisphere should be identical to the Northern Hemisphere in a lot of aspects. That that doesn't happen. And so when I made Clue 7, there were people, I said, initially when I made Clue 7, I said, look, I can't find any non-stops. And then, of course, the internet hive mind kicked in. And by the time I did Clue 8, people were saying, look, there's non-stops. And so when I was looking at them, these non-stops, I noticed that the GPS just wasn't there. It's not even there today. And we're, we're talking a couple years later to where when a plane flies over an ocean and there isn't a radar on an island between whenever it gets out of radar, ground radar range, it disappears off the screen and it goes into approximated or estimated mode, which means the plane is not being tracked. It is just out there somewhere. Now, the pilots will come back and say, and I'm still waiting for somebody to send me their data. There was, was, oh yeah, well the pilots say, well, we know where we are. It's like, ah, do you now? Because just, you know, technically your blip is still on the screen, but I think you only sort of know where you are if you're a pilot. Because remember, if the pilots didn't know where they were going, they would be pretty nervous nowadays. It's not like the old days. The GPS system should be tracking you at all the time. But I think it feeds them just approximate data and the pilots are like, okay, we'll just keep following this path and then we'll adjust as we get closer. And that's what it appears is happening. It's uh, it's fascinating. So if, yeah, if you want to look it up yourself, just go on to any flight tracker, flight aware, flight track 24, whatever it is. It's, they're, they're all pulling off the same database, which is the Department of Defense database. But when a plane gets over the ocean a certain distance, usually it's 150 or 200 miles tops, the, in the southern hemisphere mostly because you know the northern hemisphere there's there's tons of stuff between here and there the plane the the latitude and longitude will drop off and it'll go into approximated or estimated mode which again basically means we have no idea where you are right now and it's not exclusive <laughs> to the so i thought it was, initially it was exclusive to the southern hemisphere you know the uh, the indian ocean the south atlantic and the south pacific And it's not. Uh, If you're going from even up here, from here to Hawaii, remember, there's no islands between the United States and Hawaii. So when you get out over a certain distance, blink, it's gone. Your plane, yeah, you're still flying. It's not like you've gone to the twilight zone or anything, but the plane is not being tracked anymore. Not from, and and again, some people say, well, again, the pilots know. It's like, okay, then why don't the civilians get to know? Why aren't we allowed to track our loved ones? Why? Why is this not happening? So, I'm sorry, I'm, I ran. No, 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 uh, no. That's great, um, and because this also, I had, I was arguing with a buddy of mine yesterday, and you know, he's a pilot um, out of Colorado, works on planes, goes on Air Force Base. He's uh, ex-military. I was in the Air Force, but you know, I so we were arguing pretty hard. And I said, why is it when you're 30,000 feet up in the air, you can still see the horizon? If you're on a ball, you should not be able to see the horizon. Well, I don't know if I'd word it like that. The the horizon line on a plane, and you can use you look at different computer simulations, but they all work out pretty well. And that is versus a ball, uh, a flat world versus a ball. When you're rising up, the balloon example is a, a great one. Eventually... When you get up to a certain height, the horizon is going to start curving down and it's not going to rise with you. It's going to start falling away because eventually, you know, it's going to turn into a ball and then you're going to go on your way to Mars. And 
commercial airlines, I still don't believe that, you know, even Neil deGrasse Tyson will come out and say that, that you can't see it from commercial airline height or even maybe military height at 20 miles. Maybe. You should, you, there's nothing civilian you can, you can get on that you'll be able to see the curve from left to right. And so I don't generally focus on it from left to right. What I focus on is the forward and back. Because left to right, remember, we're, we're talking about gradual distances, although I will say that the SR-71 pilot that was talking, and he wasn't a flat earther, that, you know, there's, there's, every once in a while you get some Air Force flyboy jockey that'll you know do a book tour and, and talk about stuff. And this SR-71 pilot was talking about how when he was, uh, when he was up at cruising altitude in the Blackbird in Arizona, he could see Los Angeles. And I thought that was very, very interesting. It's like, eh, you shouldn't be able to see Los Angeles from Arizona. And he was saying you could see the Rocky Mountains going all the way up to Canada by the time he was in Colorado. And, I mean, vast distances on a, on a clear day. He was, he was very, very, high, you know, stuff that we can't, we can't do from a civilian standpoint. But when it comes to pilots, I always point to the forward and back, meaning the eight inches per mile squared, just looking forward. And that is distances that should be on the other side of the hill. Should be long, 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 long gone. I mean, you, you think I'm kidding? Look up a, there's a website. I think it's called Long Distance Photography, like world records. And, you know, people get on top of a mountain and they look, try to look for other mountains. And they can see stuff pushing, what, 300 miles? That's, that's way too far. Way, way too far to, to see that sort of distance. And I mean, luckily for us, or I should say, luckily for our civilization, we we weren't been we couldn't detect it be, mostly because of atmospheric conditions, and we took it for granted. Why we couldn't see the forest for the trees, uh, the Chicago skyline, a perfect example. You know, the time lapse videos that are out there. It wasn't the single snapshot of the Chicago sky skyline looking across Lake Michigan. That's not what bugged me. What bugged me was that the time lapse video was identical to the snapshot so here you are 50 miles on the other side of the lake and you're filming chicago right and people say oh it's a mirage i was going really because i just watched 12 hours of time lapse unedited and it's going through multiple weather systems you know rain comes across the buildings don't change uh, you know, different different shades of light different humidity levels it's not winter is nothing's frozen and then it goes to nighttime and things basically you know the mirage never changes so unless you can tell me uh, the occurrence uh, whether it's a superior or an inferior mirage that uh, can adjust to any weather condition any light condition including darkness and you know temperature changes that mirage doesn't 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 change wow that's pretty resilient for for a mirage anyway sorry well and a lot of people are taking those p900 right. cameras and able to sit on the beat zoom in and it shows how your normal vision could only go so right. far but they take those p900s and zoom in on stuff Miles, miles, miles out. Yeah. The, the P900, the Nikon P900, and of course, you know, I'm not endorsing the camera. It just happens to be the cheapest camera with the biggest zoom on it. I mean, you could buy more expensive cameras, but if you only want to spend with like 500 bucks, you can, it's got an 83 power zoom with like a, a double magnification in HD or something like that. And that's really what's changed. That's really what's changed the game here. Back, back, you know, I'm old school. Back in the day when we had crappy cameras and VHS tapes, pfft, flat earth couldn't you could never do that beach crap it would just be way between the atmospheric distortion and the atmospheric lensing and the fata morgana and the crappy cameras or i shouldn't say crappy just you know the the, the lack of resolution because that's what we're talking about here the uh you couldn't you couldn't pull it off the boat would be way too blurry it would be you wouldn't be able to show anything hd has changed everything when it comes to our world and how we look at things i mean HD now allows us to zoom in on boats that are so far away that you cannot see with binoculars, that you cannot see with your, your naked eye. They supposedly went over the curve. That was the whole point. That's, that is the big argument for most people out there. It's like, well, we see the boats going over the horizon. It's like, fine, you see the boat going over the horizon. Great. Is it gone? Are you sure it's gone? Let's wait another 10 minutes. Still gone? How about wait another 15 minutes? Okay, grab a camera. Start cranking this thing up. There's the boat. What happened to it? Did it go over the horizon or did it not go over the horizon? 
and then people start you know scratching their heads and it's it's a brilliant thing the again go do it yourself and and i didn't even talk about this in the in the clues this was not one of my clues the curvature of the earth it was just something people jumped on which was they grabbed an hd camera and they just cranked it up on a rise and you want to have fun just go out to a beach and you don't even have to see a boat just crank it up on the horizon and see if a boat all of a sudden appears and there's some fantastic mm. video of, of that out there and you know every once in a while you'll see that stupid pirate ship video that people have put out it's like no no it looks like it's going to the curvature i'm going fine back that sucker up from the beach and tell me what you are seeing because you're you're just showing me uh, you know, a single isolated incident where every one of those videos that stupid pirate ship i can give you 20 videos of some guy in a stupid six foot fishing boat that's got that's got to be 15 miles offshore at least and there's no way that that he should be visible and you say oh it's a mirage it's, it's an illusion it's like no it's not he's not inverted he's not wavering he's sitting there if you had a rifle powerful enough i bet you i could shoot him anyway sorry <laughs> anyway go ahead <laughs> No, no. Um, and this kind of, you know, talking about NASA, NASA just released some of its new pictures of Jupiter, I believe it was, um, right after, well, it was right on my birthday, which is October 24th. And the article was a guy, the article was actually con uh, contradicting its own self because first it would say photo and then it would go straight to image. And every other word after, well, every word after it was image. And then it actually had a guy that admitted that he took this data and photoshopped it to create it because we all know all these pictures, there are no stars. Right, right. And, and NASA isn't, they hide it in plain sight, which is even the, the, the long distance stuff that they, they supposedly take, you know, from Hubble, it's just data. And they have to send the data off to a series of graphic artists, and then the graphic artists have to, you know, they get requests from, from NASA. It's like, okay, we want, this is what we're looking for here. And they have to can't come, you know, come up with the pictures. They have to come up with the images. It's not a real picture of anything. It's a composite image, or it's just a, or it's literally just made up. So when people, when you see pictures of like black holes and I mean, not just the obvious ones, like multiple black holes crashing into each other, but everything else, you know, the, the NASA pictures of even our solar system, Saturn and Jupiter and Neptune and Pluto and all those, they look nothing like what we see through a telescope. Nothing. I mean, with the except, exception of the basic shape, when we look in a telescope, it is just a blur of light. And it is, you know, the opposite when, when NASA shows us some beautiful images. But remember, they're doing that for a very specific reason, which is the underlying subtext, you're on a globe. They don't even care if you read the article, as long as you look at the headline, as long as you look at the image. Hey, there might be a face on Mars because you're on a globe. Some sort of hexagon on the top of Saturn, globe. We're going to reclassify Pluto, globe. It just keeps going on. All they care about is that you... Rein are reinforced that you live on a globe, that you're this tiny speck floating through space, that you're small, worthless. Sorry. I know. And, and I actually did a video on that and where I read the article. The video was called Flat Earth, Show Me the Stars, New NASA Picks right. of Jupiter. And all I did was just read the actual article. Well, parts of it, I didn't read the whole thing because it was kind of retarded. And just reiterated how this guy is, the guy that created the image was saying, look at my pretty image. How do you like, I mean, basically it's like smearing it in your face that he made this out of his own conscious, whatever he wanted right. it to look like, right. basically. Oh, so, heck, you, you, don't, now, you don't even need of, Hubble. I'm sorry, let me, let me throw in one more thing. Um, find me a video of anyone on the ISS. Because remember, they're also on the dark side every once in a while, right? Find me a video of the ISS where they take the camera when they're outside and point it the other way, away from Earth to where there are stars. You can't tell me that, I mean, remember, the sun can only block out this, the starlight for so long. So when they're in the darkness side, why aren't they outside taking wonderful panoramics of the stars that are around the ISS? And they can't right. because for the same reason they couldn't do it with Apollo. The, the old rules still apply, and that is if the constellations are off, because remember, everything's time and date stamped. 
some nerd is going to find it. It's like, well, it's October 4th, it's 7 a.m., and Orion should be over here, but your picture shows it over here. Can you explain that? I mean, I've heard these questions. Look, I've been to Comic-Con. Nerds will find the questions for just about everything. You know, they, they, they bug the crap out of even, you know, the creators of anything, and that's they'll, they'll find it, and they, they're not going to take that chance. So, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, it's also the same thing. How come they don't show any satellites floating around? Even in their own pictures, you'll see them show, oh, here's our time lapse of the Earth. The clouds never morph, and there's no satellites. So many so, things about satellites what? that bother me. Uh, I'll, I'll just cover a few, though. One is, of course, that the ISS is flying around. There should be glinting. Because remember, these satellites are supposedly polished metal. They should be glinting off the sunlight all the time. You should be seeing satellites underneath them, above them, same level as them. They should be there all the time. Uh, there should be thousands of these things flying around, and yet you, you never see them. You never see, or even, dis ISS doesn't even discuss them. It's like, oh, we brushed, got within 500 yards of a satellite, or whatever it was. They, they never, ever talk about it. Two, uh, why doesn't the cascading, when... Uh, you remember the movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney? Well, that whole movie was based off of a cascading effect where one satellite ran into another satellite and another satellite, and pretty soon there was this big wall of jagged metal that eventually hit the space station and uh, you know, almost killed everybody. So why hasn't that happened yet? Because satellites should go down, law of probability. Statistics saying that some satellite should be hit by, I don't know, a meteor the size of a walnut should spin that sucker around or destroy it outright, and it should cascade into other satellites. Eventually, it's going to keep going round and round, going to hit others, and the whole satellite network would just crash, and it doesn't. And not only that, what about the, the meteor showers that we get on an annual basis, like I think the Perseus meteor shower? You know, we can see it. You know, it's a big light show in the sky, a bunch of streaks going across. Why aren't any of those satellites ever going down? Or why don't they run for cover? Start retasking satellites. We gotta get out of the way of this thing. Run for your lives. Never, ever happens. Well, you know, CNN doesn't lose a satellite. NBC doesn't, you know, radio stations. Nobody loses satellites. They fail. They all die from natural causes. Nothing gets hit by anything. Statistically, not buying it. Sorry. No, that's a good point. Now, out of all the guests that you've had on your show, which, uh, man, there's probably quite a yeah. few now, which woman was the most in intriguing to you or the most shocking revelation? Uh, I'm looking at my list real quick here. Let's see. Navy missile instructor, Air Force navigator, Marine Corps, another Navy, Army, Australian intelligence, American flight. Industrial engineer, career surveyor, international shipping expert, corporate travel agent, air traffic controller, master gunner, aviation ground training, U.S. Day surveyor. Uh, probably the the one that caught my eye more than anyone was the guy on the ground, the the surveyor, the career surveyor. Uh, good old boy, thirty two years. And the reason why is because he could re it relate, more people could relate to it. I mean, if you're in the military, most people aren't going to be firing missiles or firing submarine torpedoes or anything. This guy was down to earth, a little play on words there, uh, been doing it for 32, was doing it for 32 years, and he was a career planar surveyor. And by that, I mean, there's two types of surveyors in the world, planar, P-L-A-N-A-R, no argument, you know, no accident there, you know, meaning all their projects are built on a plane. And then geodetic surveyor, which happens to be the opposite. They build their projects on what apparently is a globe. But 95% of what we live on, in fact, even more than that, maybe 98%, that work is done by a planar surveyor. And what that means is, is that they're told to treat their project like it's on absolutely perfectly flat ground, no matter how big the project is. And he, I learned more from that interview than I did probably any others because he missed it because he couldn't see it. It was, you could not see the forest for the trees. As a rookie, he was told, it's like, well, what about the curvature of the earth? And they always tell the rookies the same thing. Don't worry about it. Literally, they, they said, don't sweat it. You know, just treat your project like it's flat, like it's a plane. And he goes, he goes, yeah, he goes, that's a great idea. He goes, but 
it only in hindsight after 30 years of retro retrospect did he finally think about it and he goes wait a minute if that's the case how exactly is everybody else is project butting up against mine remember it's it's kind of like um treating the world like a like a series of, of of wheat thins like crackers right your cracker stands in the center and eventually you have a project to the north the south the east and the west of you and, and of course the the diagonals and they all have to butt up against yours and they have to be perfectly flat he goes well what happens when you're talking about a 20 mile city or a 30 mile city because eventually the curvature is going to be used by somebody or somebody is going to make a mistake and there, somebody is like, well, did you forget the curvature of the earth? It's like, oh, so, you know, slap your head and, and then you, you move on. He goes, it never, ever, ever happened. He, he said that, he goes, he goes in, in the surveyor group, that, he goes, that's a pretty rowdy bunch. They talk to each other all the time. He goes, it never even came up in conversation. 30 years of drinking with these guys, you know, the, these, because they all knew each other. He goes, never, ever came up. And that's how he's like, holy smokes. He goes, it's not, it's not that his project is flat. He goes, the whole thing is flat. He goes, because if it isn't, eventually somebody's going to screw up. It's Again, take the wheat thins. It's like covering a basketball with wheat thins. You can't do it, exactly. There's going to be gaps, big gaps. Not, not just in elevation, but you're going to have gaps between projects. And... He goes, he, he goes, it never, ever happens. He goes, and he was talking about big, he was working on the big stuff, you know, car factories, airports, uh, you know, big, big tracts of land, 10 miles, 20 miles, you know, and, and you'd have to shoot them in chunks, but you never had to adjust for it. And, he, uh, and, and of course it made sense. Uh, let me, let me end this part with this, which is uh, the, the university of Kansas students, you know, the, the, they decide, Hey, let's see if, if Kansas is really flat. Cause everyone says that's like, well, it's, it's flat, right? And it is. It's 99.999% flat. Flat as a pancake. In fact, it's flatter than the average pancake. And that, and, and of course, we can't use that example because scientists will say, well, you're just talking about a flat pool table on, on, on a globe. It's like, yeah, but Kansas isn't the only one. There's, just in the United States alone, there's like nine states that are pretty much perfectly flat. So, you know, it's not just the Salt Lakes and you know, that are here and there. It's huge tracts of land that are absolutely flat. So how many other places are there? You know, not, not just this country, South America, Asia, Africa. That are, how, many, how many does it take before you start realizing, it's like, look, the, the world isn't a sphere. It was just, it's just a sphere in your head because you were told it was a sphere. That's it. Uh, it's in reality, it's, it's flat. It's enclosed, it's pressurized. You're, you're basically sitting in some sort of building, could be on somebody's desk for all you know. <laughs> anyway, there, that's my, my little rant. <laughs> um, y'all just had a big conference, yeah. uh, the big flat earth uh -huh. conference. Why don't you talk about how well that was received? How many people were there and did any news station attempt to even pick it oh, up? Oh, oh God. Yes. Yeah. 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 It, well, one, it was sold out. Uh, there was, there was hundreds and hundreds of people there and they, it was fantastic. It was in Raleigh, North Carolina. It was just last month. And in fact, about a month ago now, in fact, a month ago today, weird. Yeah. A month ago today. Wow. And it was fantastic. It was the most wonderful experience I've ever had with, uh, it, it was, the enthusiasm was through the roof. Everybody there was extremely excited, mostly because of the acceptance. You know, these are people that are coming from families and friends and coworkers that are giving a bunch of crap for, for Flat Earth. And when you walk in there, you know that everybody's on your page and you, you can let your guard down and, and just be yourself. And it was amazing. But what was more amazing to me was the media that, that showed up. There was a whole bunch of media and the stories are still coming out. As a matter of fact, um, uh, who's the one that just BuzzFeed just released theirs a month later uh, on YouTube. And the, the, I mean, that was BuzzFeed. There was, I mean, ABC Nightline, we're still waiting for their story. HBO covered it. Uh, Australian newspapers, French newspapers, uh, German television was there. Uh, British tele BBC was there. British television. I did. I think I had the most, but there were other people that did. You know, quite a few. I did fourteen interviews in two days. 
uh, to the point where I was missing sessions because I they were just pulling me off into rooms saying, okay, look, we want to shoot this and we want to shoot that. And it was, the, the coverage was fantastic, better than I could have ever hoped. And it's led to secondary ripples to where now, if you go into, in fact, it just, it just happened over the last couple of weeks. If you go into YouTube and type in Flat Earth, no filters, the top 20 videos are mostly large YouTube channels. You know, verified hundreds of thousands of people. They're, everybody's covering this now. Because so, once the mainstream started running the story, well, you know, YouTube picks up off of that. And so the YouTube channels were running their stuff off of the mainstream stuff. So the, the secondary ripples are amazing. So, yeah, it was a great conference. Fantastic. Wouldn't have traded it for the world. No, I, I, I wish I could have attended, but I was kind of too busy doing my own stuff here in Dallas. So, you know, I figured, well, it'll come out on YouTube. Oh, yeah. I'll get to watch it yep. later. So yeah. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't no, it was it. there's great great footage of it. It was recorded, uh, and everybody had we had multiple cameras on it. Uh, heck, there was there was a, a documentary team from Los Angeles. They're trying to do a full documentary on the whole flat Earth phenomena. They uh, they were there for the duration, and they should be doing something at the beginning of 2018. Crossing my fingers. Nice. I'm looking forward to seeing yeah. that. Now. The only one thing that that has started up kind of recently is it seems there's some dissension with some of the people, you know, like Eric DeBay or Matt Powerland. And, you know, they always want to, you know, they're kind of everybody's being this like infighting. It's, and to me, I, I hate that because, it, you know, we're all of the same it's community. Competition. No, no different than any other industry or group. I mean, look, especially in the United States, we have fierce competition for, for everything. Look at the world of politicians, for example. Uh, you know, they, it's all about mudslinging and tearing the other guy down because singing your praises is one thing, but it doesn't grab the attention as much as negative drama does that, you know, when, you, when you're going after somebody. Look at the, the entertainment world the the fierce competition you know you're in a waiting room with 30 other people that would just as soon trip you in the stairwell to keep you from going to that audition uh the, it is it that's all we're talking about here is is competition that's all it is it, this is an untapped market still even now uh there has been very little uh, monetization of this of this topic uh, you, you know no there's no television shows there's no movies on it the product lines, nobody's trademarked anything. You know, there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different t-shirts out there and posters and, and some 3D models, but that's basically it. And so beforehand, it was just the gold rush for, excuse me, for social media. But now we're on the cusp of the gold, the actual gold rush, where there's producers trying to figure out how they can turn this thing into making money. It you know poses its own problems, but it, it was eventually going to happen. We've uh, the numbers we've been generating are too high, and they have been too high for the mainstream world to ignore. And it has taken it has taken some real doing, but we've done it basically without without any marketing dollars, which you know with the exception of a few uh, billboards here and there. But it's it's been amazing. I mean, look at look at the Mad Mike, the the rocket thing, the Rocket Man thing. You know, we we helped finance his rocket you know, put big stickers on the side of it. And just that headline generated a huge, huge amount. I mean, every major media story covered it because it was catchy. Rocket Man tied to Flat Earth. You know, it, it, that story, you, you can't ignore that headline. It's too easy not to run. And it's been it's been an amazing ride so far. Uh, but yeah, the ascension in the ranks is going to be there. I don't care what topic you're talking about. It's going to be there. As long as there's, as long as people have a way of climbing the ladder, and I've I've said this in various things recently. Look, it comes down to merit. Some people have tried to sneak their way in. Some people have tried to take shortcuts here and there, but it still comes down to merit. What have you done to advance the community? What have you done? And that it does carry weight with a lot of people. And so for me, I'm just relying on merit. I'm not going to tear anybody down. I mean, yeah, I disagree with Eric's side views on life that aren't flat earth related and when it comes to matt i wish he would be more focused because i think he could have 
really been a bigger player in this. I wanted, I, I wasn't shy about telling people, I was like, look, I initially got into this or got more into this because people were looking for Matt through me because I had my phone number out there. I, I keep telling, I was like, look, just if you want to be, you want to, you want to put yourself in a more high profile place in the community, you have to do exactly that. You have to put yourself out there. Your real name your real phone number, or at the very least, your real email address. Tell people how to find you because the media is lazy. <laughs> they are they're notoriously lazy. I, I, I'll use, let me, let me sidetrack to Bill Nye real quick, which is Bill Nye, the reason why he is on television so much is because the media is too lazy to find somebody else that's better than him. Meaning he doesn't even have a master's degree in anything, right? He's got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, but because he looks, he's thin, he has angular features, he wears a bow tie and a lab coat or a suit in a, in a bow tie, <laughs> then, you know, they, they say, well, he can kind of sound the part. He, he, he fits the definition of your, of your nerd on camera. Let's bring him on because they know if they go to the, the local university, I don't care if it's, if it's Harvard or Stanford or MIT, those guys are really, really dry. Nerds have horrible social skills. This particular nerd, and he's not even that good a nerd. I could out nerd this guy. I won't go into it. So, but he, <laughs> but they, he looks like a nerd. So it's like, okay, if he fits the visuals and he and he fits the demographic that we're looking for on camera, and he doesn't talk in one syllable answers like a normal university professor would, because you know they're these are published guys, guys with masters and PhDs. They're not going to go off the cuff and just start flying with it. The uh, he he works, and so I'm sorry. The one came back to it is the media is lazy. So when it comes to the infighting, you guys can fight all you want, but until you put your name out there, or I don't know, make yourself a little more high profile, or I don't know, make yourself a little more palatable. Nothing I can, nothing I can, I can do for you. So there, there you go. Yeah, I just, I would just uh, wish that the infighting would stop and we all kind of uh, come together. I mean, because everybody has a if we, peace. If, but, if we get a common know, enemy, yes, we will. It that will happen. I pretty predicted this right in the beginning, and that was I was hoping that we would get some mainstream science. Is why I did my declaration of war recently where I said, okay, I've just got to take the fight to them because they're they're just they're taking too long. So I put a thing out there. I said, any university, if you want to create some little academic body to get, go against me, you fly me out, you put me in a hotel room, I'll go up against anybody you want. I don't care because we, without a common enemy, we won't have complete unity. And that's what I'm hoping to draw out is the, uh, the common enemy. I don't care if it's a NASA guy or it's an MIT guy. Uh, at this point, I've done so many interviews that I, we, this, this is the logical next step for me. No, I, I agree with you. And you have enough background in there on this subject. You would be able to d debate them out of their pants. Yeah. So it would be great. And I'm sure nobody's even talked but, to you about but, but, taking you up on it. Believe it or not, I, you know, cause I just did the declaration of war a couple days ago. And I already have one from Southern California, from a uh, from UCLA. As a matter of fact, they're they're toying with the idea right now, and so it's like, yeah, uh, I, I, that surprised me though. I wouldn't have bet on it, and who knows if it'll it'll go through or not. But that's what I'm looking for. It's like just bring me out, let them come at me with everything you got, because the 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 eventually that's what they're you know, it is taking the hits, and. You know, even even if scientists will be in denial, because everyone in those those rooms will still be. It's like again, if you're working on your master's degree in a physical science, you're you're doomed. There's nothing. You're, you're the brainwashing is too much. But if I can hold my own, it's all I want. No, I think you'll do very well. You you're really articulate. You stay on point. You have a lot of background in this now for since you started this whole proceeding so yeah i think you're going to do quite well and by all means you definitely want to film all that stuff because <laughs> it's going to go major yeah viral. well yeah because scientists will say oh we did this to him we did this to him and it's like uh not really because i've got in fact the, the guy i'm going to be working on i think he's from georgetown uh and this had nothing to do with the declaration of war uh, I'm working on him on 
Monday or Tuesday. And I mean, I've got a series of just five questions that will basically, you know, scientists and, and they're, you know, they've got some, some math built in there. They're not just connect the dot questions that science can't answer. And it, they should be on a stumbling block you know, immediately. And we'll see. Crossing my fingers. Yeah. Well, now that some major entertainers have come out and kind of broken the ice on this too, this is this has really kind of gone out of the media's control. Now they can't control it. So what do you think would be the next, uh, other than doing a debate like that, how, what do you see as the next major step moving forward now? Uh, for flat Earth, it's got to go deep into mainstream. I mean, right now we're still on the on the edge of mainstream, and by that I mean some sort of production, something's got to be made. And I know the documentary. There's multiple people working on documentaries. I hope the the one team that I've been working with uh, from LA. I hope they come out first. Uh, but if they don't, it's not a huge deal. I mean, everything for a reason. Uh, whether it be a television show, whether it be, you know, a series of, of exposés, who knows, you know, on a pay channel. I don't, I don't know, I, but that's what we should have next is, is the, the deep, you know, basically embed ourselves into mainstream to where we're not going away. Because once we do that, then it becomes a topic that people aren't ashamed to talk about because it's in mainstream. You know, once once it's got that stamp of approval by mainstream, then people can talk about it, whether they love it or hate it. They can they can they can actually talk about it at the water cooler, and they won't feel completely uh, ostracized. So after that, then we have to see what the next move is. You know, from from the powers that be, because sooner or later. You're going to, uh, unfortunately, when you when you talk about being more mainstream, you're going to talk about more more questions and serious questions, to where you know important people start calling important people, and then you've got congressional hearings, so, because eventually you you you'd have to ask some questions like, so wait, what has NASA been doing? That's the big one, because NASA's too big to fail, and the companies that back NASA are too big to fail. So what do you do? Well, you know, you're you're going to have to let them off the hook. So how do you do that? And it's going to be, have to be some sort of disclosure. I don't know exactly what form it'll take, but that's what we're talking about here is a form of a disclosure, meaning you've got to say, okay, NASA was doing it for the right reasons. That's always the excuse, isn't it? You know, it's like, well, I was under orders. Okay, why were you under orders? Well, because civilization might have crumbled or all the, 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 the scenarios we ran said that civilization was going to burn down or that whoever built this place told us not to tell, you know, something like that. It's just like, okay, you know, cause you have to, you have to let NASA off the hook. You can't let them go. You can't let this get into a legal proceeding. You can't, it's, I mean, we saw what happened with the, the financial crisis with AIG. You just can't, you can't let it get that far. So I'm hoping for glass half full, something that we, when we move forward, it turns into, to a fun, uh, a fun thing where everyone's united. And I know I'm being optimistic, you know, cause our civilization has never really gone down that path. But I, I got to keep a positive attitude about it. Right, because like you have said before, I mean, not only NASA, look at all the major universities that have been cramming this down our throats, right. all the schools. Right. I mean, they're, all the subcontractors, everybody that's directly or indirectly tied into the, the whole space program they're all out of a job the next day. Yeah, the, yeah, so the, now yeah, the space at... programs would be out of a job. You're absolutely right. Uh, and not just the Americans. It would be you know, the, the Japanese, the Europeans, the, the Russians, the Indian, uh, Israelis. I didn't even know the Israelis had a program until this year. So, yeah, oh, that, right? so, yeah <laughs> the, it's, it's dicey. You, you're going to have to come up. Uh, the other side of that, of course, you could create a big enough distraction to where nobody cares. Uh, some sort of war, some sort of advanced terrorist attack we've never seen. You know, that's the dark side of it. It's like, okay, we'll just create something so big, some misdirection so huge that nobody's even going to think about Flat Earth. It's like, Flat Earth, we just lost Charleston, South Carolina to a dirty bomb. How can you even be thinking about that? It's like, oh, uh, seriously? You know, you don't want that to happen. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it wouldn't, it would not surprise me because men, you know, the old tricks are the best tricks. 
And you know, some of these guys don't want a happy kumbaya moment. They want to. Uh, they, you know, some people want to turn it into a purge. And I get, I get that too. I, I understand both sides, but, but I, for me, I, I try to look towards the positive. Well, and you said because this kind of goes back into the spirituality of stuff because a lot of the talks that I've been having with Cody. We're getting deep into the spirituality, bringing the light, bringing the truth to all this corruption, evil corruption that has been going on and dominating our society for decades and decades and decades. And I tell everybody, everything you know to be true is a lie. But what you have found is, I if, correct me if I'm wrong, but at first you really didn't believe in God. And then after getting in the flat earth, did you change your mind about I that? I was always, I was raised a, a strong born again Christian f for uh, all the way up until the point I got to college and, sorry, university. I'm supposed to say university because outside of the United States, they actually, college is c considered something different. Uh, but at university, I realized that, that the world was a much, much bigger place and there was more than one religion. There was, and so I fell away from the church for a number of years, decades, as a matter of fact. Oh, yes, this pulled me back into it because for the obvious reasons, and that is if it was built, then there's a creator. If it's a creator, you've never been alone, and you know, the, if this, I'm talking about a structure that is in no way organic. You know, if you're, you're talking about a, a basically a sports stadium that, that's, that we're living in, well, you know, that's way less organic than some little speck of dust that's flying through space. So, yeah, yeah, this thing really pulled me back in. It's tough to be an atheist and be in flat earth. I mean, it's, I know some people claim that they can be. It's like, nah, not buying it. Because at the very least, you're saying that there's an advanced power, you know, something much, much bigger than ourselves that built this place. And if you want to say, well, it's aliens, it's like, okay, well, then you're already down that, down that path. And that is, okay, well, who made them? And when I, by the way, when I say aliens nowadays, I don't even, I, I never mean that in the way, because uh, I don't have a n different name for it. Uh, I don't mean like from Mars or Venus or Saturn. I just mean from outside of this place or inside of this place, you know, just a, a foreign group. I mean, you know, the people that, uh, the civilizations that were here before us, technically they could be called aliens, I suppose. Uh, but I just consider them older versions of us. Sorry, that's my. Well, I, I, I certainly don't, you know, hold uh, go into the big monolithic churches as, you know, the, the for me, it's all about, you know, spirituality within yourself. And, and I, I've always believed in God and that there was a higher power. And once I started getting into the flat earth, it really solidified a lot of stuff, it's, especially when you start reading, a, you know, the first page of, of the Bible when it talked about the, um, oh, what's it, what's it called again? Um, the, uh, <laughs> no, uh, where he's talking about, you know, basically. Oh, the oh Genesis. Oh, I'd have to Gen give up. I'm sorry. Psalm, well, there's Psalms 19.1. He who, the, the firmament shows his handiwork or uh, Genesis 1.8, which was uh, the firmament that separates the waters above from the waters below. That sort of thing. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. it, exactly, the firmament. And that just kind of solidified a lot more stuff with me. It's like there is a higher power, and, yeah, we were created by somebody. And it's like you had said before, if there is a God, which I believe there is, then we're not alone, and you're accountable for your right. actions. So it doesn't give you the, the moral authority to just go out there and just shoot people and think, oh, nothing's going to happen. no. There's somebody up there watching, yeah. and so you better do yeah. right. And so, again, maybe that maybe that, that was the reason why the globe was initially put out there to see how people would act without parental supervision. Look, parents do this all the time. And it's like, all right, well, the kids, you know, if the, you know, the kids don't think I'm watching, right? But I am watching. But once you once you know, that's that's when it changes. You know, that's that's why I think. Uh, once once you know where you are, once you know you're in this enclosed world, then you pretty much better be on your best behavior. <laughs> Agreed. I totally agree. Well, 
I, I think we kind of covered quite an array of topics. Is there any one point that you really feel like you want to stress or get out yeah, today? Yeah, and that is don't believe a word I just said. Don't believe anything I'm talking about here. <laughs> don't don't take my word for it or any YouTube video for it. Do your own research. Anyone that's listening to this for the first time or just kind of on the fence about it is like, look, I didn't get into Flat Earth because I wanted to get in Flat Earth. Flat Earth is a stupid, ridiculous thing. I didn't find Flat Earth. Flat Earth found me. And it found a whole bunch of other people. I tried to debunk it. And I failed. You may try to debunk it as well. The question is, how long will you hold out? Because you won't be able to solve it entirely. Either one of two things will happen. Either you will... Just stop and say, you know what, I'm not looking into this any further, and you'll stay in denial, and you'll say, look, it's dumb, Flat Earth is dumb, Flat Earth is, you know, that's all you'll do. Or you'll get to the point where I, I was, where it's like, you know what, I can't prove the globe anymore, which shouldn't be the case. And once you're opened up to that, well, then everything changes. So do your own research, ask questions, and enjoy the ride, because that's really what it is. It's, it's an interesting ride that... Uh, will take you places I guarantee you have not been. Just to buttress up what you were saying, when I, I first did the first interview with you, I was I was kind of talking about how your video popped up in one of my suggested videos. And I thought, flat earth. And I, you know, and I even said this. I was like, what kind of retard would make a video about this? This has got to be so dumb. I'll debunk this so yeah. fast. I clicked on it and watched it, and then that's when you came out with all the different clues, and I went to the next one, and then I went to the next one, and then I went to the next one. By the time I got done, I was like, I've got to call this guy. I, I can't debunk this. This is not right. right. Let me let me call this guy. And, yeah, you're right. You'll have to do your own research on this, but the harder you try to debunk yeah. it, the worse it yeah. gets. It's an amazing – and what eventually you'll have that tipping point where – you start to believe it. It's kind of like the, uh, the the analogy I came up with recently is it's kind of like being told you're adopted. And you, it's like, who cares? You know, it's like, who cares? You know, like kind of like who cares if the world is round or flat? Well, it doesn't matter. You're absolutely right until you start believing it. And then it absolutely matters. Sort of like if you're adopted, it's like, I don't care. I wouldn't even care if I was adopted. It's like, yeah, that's just because you're not believing it. But once, once that inkling, it's like, wait, maybe I am adopted. Once, once that happens, you immediately start revisiting every conversation you've had with your family going all the way back to you were five years old. That's what we're talking about here. It's ripples in time to where once you start believing it, all of a sudden your memory starts flashing back to every time you saw that stupid globe sitting in your classroom. And that's how you knew. That's how you knew was where you lived. Was, it was, let, me, let me end on this. Remember, everything else in the physical world you can test right now. Fire burns, water is wet, drop something, it falls to the ground. That appears to be something like gravity, whatever you want to call it. These are, something's, these are things you can test. When it comes to the shape of the world you live in, that is something you are told. Period. That's it. That is something you were, you were told when you were a child. It's like, this is where you live. This is where you live. And then after a while, they just stop telling you because they just left the globe in the classroom. It is classic conditioning. And the question is, will you be able to snap out of it? I think you will. Anyway, that's my that's my piece for today. Well, I want to seriously thank you for coming back on. It has been a very good conversation. We were able to pretty much collapse a couple of years worth of your interviews down into a, a little over an hour or so on this on this little uh, cool. recording. So I, I want to thank you very much. It has been your videos. You have all these people that are putting that uh, flat earth on their license plates. You're comp <laughs> compiling all that, making all those yeah. videos. I know you're a super busy dude. And um, I, uh, I hope you get to be so mainstream that you know your name will be synonymous with flat earth and people will say oh yeah mark Sargent, he's he's the one that woke me up because to be honest you were the one who woke me up to this well, so i think yeah thank oh, you oh no for you're, that. you're very welcome and i and i hope i don't end up being you know, the the flat earth mainstream villain 
but if that role comes, I I don't mind. You know, this is going to it's going to be some some growing pains you know, so on a on a much larger scale before we finally get there. But I'm just humble to be a part of it. Well, myself, and like I say, just uh, having you come back on here and sharing all this information with uh, the people that are on this channel, you know, they're going to get their eyes woken too. So no matter what they want to say, you know, they're going to have to grow up about right. this. And that's just, Agreed. <laughs> and that's, that's the whole world too. So it's not just people in America, even though America, you know, we're pretty dumbed down and lazy um, about a lot of stuff, but there's a great epiphany coming and there's a lot of truth bombs coming out. 2018 is probably going to be one of the biggest years for truth bombs to be readily accepted by people instead of just being dismissed as a conspiracy theory, a CIA right. term, right. you know? So I, I do think uh, 2018, which is, you know, just only a couple of weeks away, is going to be a big year for all of us. And I know it's going to be a big year for you. So thank you very much for coming on here. And uh, we'll go ahead and close this out. Just hang on okay. one second and uh, let me finish this off. So all you people that have been listening, I hope you enjoyed the show. It was very entertaining for me. I got to learn a couple of new things that I didn't even know. I, I didn't even know about a tour and a vacuum and blah, blah, blah. So that was kind of cool. So if you like these videos, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. Like I say, if you want to mirror it, you have my permission. Just give a little credit to Snafu Radio. And other than that, y'all have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. God bless, good night, and Snafu out.